Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Sam in Japan, Melody, Megan, Mateo, and Doris. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime, and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive monthly episodes heard nowhere else. You'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. And just one more quick note. I've been having some pretty serious allergy problems for the last six weeks, largely because I've been surrounded by dust during a major move. So I apologize if these recordings have been a little nasally. I promise it's temporary, and I appreciate your patience. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we conclude a month of relaxing journeys with a return to an exploration of some of the most beautiful spots in the United States by reading more from our national parks by John Muir, first published in 1901. Let's pick up right where we left off in Chapter 1, The Wild Parks and Forest Reservations of the West. Let's begin. The vast Pacific Coast Reserves in Washington and Oregon, the Cascade, Washington, Mount Rainier, Olympic, Bull Run, and Ashland, named in order of size, include more than 12,500,000 acres of magnificent forests of beautiful and gigantic trees. They extend over the wild, unexplored Olympic Mountains and both flanks of the Cascade Range, the wet and the dry. On the east side of the Cascades, the woods are sunny and open, and contain principally yellow pine of moderate size, but of great value as a cover for the irrigating streams that flow into the dry interior, where agriculture on a grand scale is being carried on. Along the moist, balmy, foggy west flank of the mountains facing the sea, the woods reach their highest development, and excepting for the California redwoods, are the heaviest on the continent. They are made up mostly of the Douglas spruce, Pseudotsuga taxifolia, with the giant arbor vitae or cedar, and several species of fir and hemlock in varying abundance, forming a forest kingdom unlike any other in which limb meets limb, touching and overlapping in bright, lively, triumphant exuberance, 250, 300, and even 400 feet above the shady, mossy ground. Over all the other species, the Douglas spruce reigns supreme. It is not only a large tree, the tallest in America next to the redwood, but a very beautiful one, with bright green drooping foliage, handsome pendant cones, and a shaft exquisitely straight and round and regular. 
forming extensive forests by itself in many places. It lifts its spiry tops into the sky, close together, with as even a growth as a well-tilled field of grain. No ground has been better tilled for wheat than these Cascade Mountains for trees. They were plowed by mighty glaciers, and harrowed and mellowed and outspread by the broad streams that flowed from the ice plows as they were withdrawn at the close of the glacial period. In proportion to its weight when dry, Douglas spruce timber is perhaps stronger than that of any other large conifer in the country, and being tough, durable, and elastic, it is admirably suited for shipbuilding, piles, and heavy timbers in general. But its hardness and liability to warp when it is cut into boards render it unfit for fine work. In the lumber markets of California, it is called Oregon Pine. When lumbering is going on in the best Douglas woods, especially about Puget Sound, many of the long, slender bowls are saved for spars, and so superior is their quality that they are called for in almost every shipyard in the world, and it is interesting to follow their fortunes. Felled and peeled and dragged to tidewater, they are raised again as yards and mast for ships, given iron roots and canvas foliage, decorated with flags and sent to sea, where in glad motion they go cheerily over the ocean prairie in every latitude and longitude, singing and bowing responsive to the same winds that waved them when they were in the woods. After standing in one place for centuries, they thus go round the world like tourists, meeting many a friend from the old home forest, some traveling like themselves, some standing head downward in muddy harbors, holding up the platforms of wharves, and others doing all kinds of hard timber work showy or hidden. This wonderful tree also grows far northward in British Columbia and southward along the coast and middle regions of Oregon and California, flourishing with the redwood wherever it can find an opening and with the sugar pine, yellow pine, and libocedrus in the Sierra. It extends into the San Gabriel San Bernardino and San Jacinto Mountains of Southern California. It also grows well on the Wasatch Mountains, where it is called Red Pine, and on many parts of the Rocky Mountains and short interior ranges of the Great Basin. But though thus widely distributed, only in Oregon, Washington, and some parts of British Columbia does it reach perfect development. To one who looks from some high standpoint over its vast breadth, the forest on the west side of the Cascades seems all one dim, dark, monotonous field, broken only by the white volcanic cones along the summit of the range. Back in the untrodden wilderness, a deep furred carpet of brown and yellow mosses covers the ground like a garment, pressing about the feet of the trees and rising in rich bosses, softly and kindly, over every rock and moldering trunk, leaving no spot uncared for, and dotting small prairies and fringing the meadows and the banks of streams not seen in general views, we find, besides the great conifers, a considerable number of hardwood trees. Oak, ash, maple, alder, wild apple, cherry, arbutus, nuttles flowering dogwood, and in some places, 
chestnuts. In a few favored spots, the broad-leaved maple grows to a height of a hundred feet in forests by itself, sending out large limbs and magnificent interlacing arches covered with mosses and ferns, thus forming lofty sky gardens and rendering the underwoods delightfully cool. No finer forest ceiling is to be found than these maple arches, while the floor, ornamented with tall ferns and rubus vines, and cast into hillocks by the bulging moss-covered roots of the trees, matches it well. Passing from beneath the heavy shadows of the woods, almost anywhere, one steps into lovely gardens of lilies, orchids, heathworts, and wild roses. Along the lower slopes, especially in Oregon, where the woods are less dense, there are miles of rhododendron, making glorious masses of purple in the spring, while all about the streams and the lakes and the beaver meadows, there is a rich tangle of hazel, plum, cherry, crabapple, cornell, galtheria, and rubus, with myriads of flowers and abundance of other more delicate bloomers, such as erythronium, brodea, fritillaria, calacortus, clintonia, and the lovely hider of the north, calypso. Beside all these bloomers, there are wonderful ferneries about the many misty waterfalls. Some of the fronds ten feet high, others the most delicate of their tribe, the maidenhair fringing the rocks within reach of the lightest dust of the spray, while the shading trees on the cliffs above them, leaning over, look like eager listeners anxious to catch every tone of the restless waters. In the autumn, berries of every color and flavor abound, enough for birds, bears, and everybody, particularly about the stream sides and meadows where sunshine reaches the ground. Huckleberries, red, blue, and black, some growing close to the ground, others on bushes ten feet high. Galtheria berries called salal by the Indians. Salmon berries an inch in diameter, growing in dense prickly tangles. The flowers, like wild roses, still more beautiful than the fruit. Raspberries, gooseberries, currants, blackberries, and strawberries. The underbrush and meadow fringes are in great part made up of these berry bushes and vines. But in the depths of the woods, there is not much underbrush of any kind. Only a thin growth of rubus, huckleberry, and vine maple. Notwithstanding the outcry against the reservations last winter in Washington, that uncounted farms, towns, and villages were included in them, and that all business was threatened or blocked, nearly all the mountains in which the reserves lie are still covered with virgin forests. Though lumbering has long been carried on with tremendous energy along their boundaries, and home seekers have explored the woods for openings available for farms, however small. One may wander in the heart of these reserves for weeks without meeting a human being or any conspicuous trace of one. Indians used to ascend the main streams on their way to the mountains for wild goats, whose wool furnished them clothing but with food in abundance on the coast, there was little to draw them into the woods, and the monuments they have left there are scarcely more conspicuous than those of birds and squirrels, and far less so than those of the beavers, 
which have dammed streams and made clearings that will endure for centuries. Nor is there much in these woods to attract cattle keepers. Some of the first settlers made farms on the small bits of prairie and in the comparatively open valleys of Washington. But before the gold period, most of the immigrants from the eastern states settled in the fertile and open Willamette Valley of Oregon. Even now, when the search for tillable land is so keen, excepting the bottomlands of the rivers around Puget Sound, there are few cleared spots in all western Washington. On every meadow or opening of any sort, someone will be found keeping cattle, raising hops, or cultivating patches of grain, but these spots are few and far between. All the larger spaces were taken long ago. Therefore, most of the newcomers build their cabins where the beavers built theirs. They keep a few cows, laboriously widen their little meadow openings by hacking, girdling, and burning the rim of the close pressing forest, and scratch and plant among the huge blackened logs and stumps, girdling and killing themselves in killing the trees. Most of the farmlands of Washington and Oregon, excepting the valleys of the Willamette and Rogue Rivers, lie on the east side of the mountains. The forests on the eastern slope of the Cascades fail altogether ere the foot of the range is reached, stayed by drought, as suddenly as on the west side they are stopped by the sea, showing strikingly how dependent are these forest giants on the generous rains and fogs so often complained of in the coast climate. The lower portions of the reserves are solemnly soaked and poulticed in rain and fog during the winter months, and there is a sad dearth of sunshine. But with a little knowledge of woodcraft, anyone may enjoy an excursion into these woods even in the rainy season. The big gray days are exhilarating, and the colors of leaf and branch and mossy bowl are then at their best. The mighty trees, getting their food, are seen to be wide awake, every needle thrilling in the welcome nourishing storms, chanting and bowing low in glorious harmony, while every raindrop and snowflake is seen as a beneficent messenger from the sky. The snow that falls on the lower woods is mostly soft, coming through the trees in downy tufts, loading their branches and bending them down against the trunks until they look like arrows, while a strange muffled silence prevails, making everything impressively solemn. But these lowland snowstorms and their effects quickly vanish. The snow melts in a day or two, sometimes in a few hours. The bent branches spring up again, and all the forest work is left to the fog and the rain. At the same time, dry snow is falling on the upper forests and mountaintops. Day after day, often for weeks, the big clouds give their flowers without ceasing, as if knowing how important is the work they have to do. The glinting, swirling swarms thicken the blast, and the trees and rocks are covered to a depth of ten or twenty feet. Then the mountaineer, snug in a grove with bread and fire, has nothing to do but gaze and listen and enjoy. Ever and anon, the deep, low roar of the storm is broken by the booming of avalanches. As the snow slips from the overladen heights and crushes down the long white slopes to fill the fountain hollows, 
All the smaller streams are crushed and buried, and the young groves of spruce and fir near the edge of the timber line are gently bowed to the ground and put to sleep, not again to see the light of day or stir branch or leaf until the spring. These grand reservations should draw thousands of admiring visitors, at least in summer, yet they are neglected as if of no account, and spoilers are allowed to ruin them as fast as they like. A few peeled spars cut here were set up in London, Philadelphia, and Chicago, where they excited wondering attention but the countless hosts of living trees rejoicing at home on the mountains are scarce considered at all. Most travelers here are content with what they can see from car windows or the verandas of hotels, and in going from place to place, cling to their precious trains and stages like wrecked sailors to rafts. When an excursion into the woods is proposed, all sorts of dangers are imagined. Snakes, bears, Indians. Yet it is far safer to wander in God's woods than to travel on black highways or to stay at home. The snake danger is so slight it is hardly worth mentioning. Bears are a peaceable people and mind their own business. Instead of going about like the devil seeking whom they may devour. Poor fellows, they have been poisoned, trapped, and shot until they have lost confidence in brother man, and it is not now easy to make their acquaintance. As to Indians, most of them are gone. No American wilderness that I know of is so dangerous as a city home with all the modern improvements. One should go to the woods for safety if for nothing else. Lewis and Clark, in their famous trip across the continent, 1804 to 1805, did not lose a single man by Indians or animals, though all the West was then wild Captain Clark was bitten on the hand as he lay asleep. That was one bite among more than a hundred men while traveling 9,000 miles. Loggers are far more likely to be met than Indians or bears in the reserves or about their boundaries. Brown, weather-tanned men with faces furrowed like bark, tired-looking, moving slowly, swaying like the trees they chop. A little of everything in the woods is fastened to their clothing, rosiny and smeared with balsam, and rubbed into it, so that their scanty outer garments grow thicker with use and never wear out. Many a forest giant have these old woodmen felled, but round-shouldered and stooping, they too are leaning over and tottering to their fall. Others, however, stand ready to take their places. Stout young fellows erect as saplings. And always the foes of trees outnumber their friends. Far up the white peaks, one can hardly fail to meet the wild goat or American chamois an admirable mountaineer, familiar with woods and glaciers as well as rocks, and in leafy thickets deer will be found. While gliding about unseen, there are many sleek furred animals enjoying their beautiful lives, and birds also, notwithstanding few are noticed in hasty walks. The oozel sweetens the glens and gorges where the streams flow fastest, and every grove has its singers, however silent it seems. Thrushes, linnets, warblers. 
Hummingbirds glint about the fringing bloom of the meadows and peaks, and the lakes are stirred into lively pictures by waterfowl. The Mount Rainier Forest Reserve should be made a national park and guarded while yet its bloom is on. For if in the making of the West, nature had what we call parks in mind, places for rest, inspiration, and prayer, this Rainier region must surely be one of them. In the center of it, there is a lonely mountain capped with ice. From the ice cap, glaciers radiate in every direction, and young rivers from the glaciers. While its flanks, sweeping down in beautiful curves, are clad with forests and gardens, and filled with birds and animals. Specimens of the best of nature's treasures have been lovingly gathered here and arranged in simple, symmetrical beauty within regular bounds. Of all the fire mountains which, like beacons, once blazed along the Pacific coast, Mount Rainier is the noblest in form, has the most interesting forest cover, and, with perhaps the exception of Shasta, is the highest and most flowery. Its massive white dome rises out of its forests, like a world by itself, to a height of 14,000 to 15,000 feet. The forests reach to a height of a little over 6,000 feet, and above the forest there is a zone of the loveliest flowers, 50 miles in circuit and nearly 2 miles wide so closely planted and luxuriant that it seems as if nature, glad to make an open space between woods so dense and ice so deep, were economizing the precious ground and trying to see how many of her darlings she can get together in one mountain wreath. Daisies, anemones, geraniums, columbines, erythroniums, larkspurs, etc., among which we wade, knee-deep and waist-deep, the bright corollas in myriads touching petal to petal. Picturesque detached groups of the spiry Abies laziocarpa stand like islands along the lower margin of the garden zone, while on the upper margin there are extensive beds of Bryanthus, Cassiopeia, Calmia, and other heathworts, and higher still, saxifrages and drabas, more and more lowly, reach up to the edge of the ice. Altogether, this is the richest subalpine garden I ever found, a perfect floral elysium. The icy dome needs none of man's care, but unless the reserve is guarded, the flower bloom will soon be killed, and nothing of the forest will be left but black stump monuments. The Sierra of California is the most openly beautiful and useful of all the forest reserves, and the largest excepting the Cascade Reserve of Oregon and the bitter root of Montana and Idaho. It embraces over four million acres of the grandest scenery and grandest trees on the continent, and its forests are planted just where they do the most good, not only for beauty, but for farming in the great San Joaquin Valley beneath them. It extends southward from the Yosemite National Park to the end of the range, a distance of nearly 200 miles. No other coniferous forest in the world contains so many species, or so many large and beautiful trees. Sequoia gigantea, king of conifers, the noblest of a noble race, as Sir Joseph Hooker well says. 
the sugar pine, king of all the world's pines, living or extinct. The yellow pine, next in rank, which here reaches most perfect development, forming noble towers of verdure 200 feet high. The mountain pine, which braves the coldest blasts far up the mountains on grim rocky slopes. And five others, flourishing each in its place, making eight species of pine in one forest, which is still further enriched by the great Douglas spruce. Libocedrus, two species of silver fir, large trees and exquisitely beautiful. The Pathan hemlock, the most graceful of evergreens. The curious Tumian, oaks of many species, maples, alders, poplars, and flowering dogwood, all fringed with flowery underbrush, manzanita, ceanothus, wild rose, cherry, chestnut, and rhododendron. Wandering at random through these friendly, approachable woods, one comes here and there to the loveliest lily gardens, some of the lilies ten feet high, and the smoothest gentian meadows, and Yosemite valleys known only to mountaineers. Once I spent a night by a campfire on Mount Shasta with Asa Gray and Sir Joseph Hooker, and knowing that they were acquainted with all the great forests of the world, I asked whether they knew any coniferous forest that rivaled that of the Sierra. They unhesitatingly said no. In the beauty and grandeur of individual trees, and in number and variety of species, the Sierra forests surpass all others. This Sierra Reserve, proclaimed by the President of the United States in September 1893, is worth the most thoughtful care of the government for its own sake, without considering its value as the fountain of the rivers on which the fertility of the great San Joaquin Valley depends, yet it gets no care at all. In the fog of tariff, silver, and annexation politics, it is left wholly unguarded, though the management of the adjacent national parks by a few soldiers shows how well and how easily it can be preserved. In the meantime, lumbermen are allowed to spoil it at their will, and sheep in uncountable ravenous hordes to trample it and devour every green leaf within reach. While the shepherds, like destroying angels, set innumerable fires, which burn not only the undergrowth of seedlings, on which the permanence of the forest depends, but countless thousands of the venerable giants. If every citizen could take one walk through this reserve, there would be no more trouble about its care, for only in darkness does vandalism flourish. The reserves of Southern California, the San Gabriel, San Bernardino, San Jacinto, and Trabuco, though not large, only about two million acres together, are perhaps the best appreciated. Their slopes are covered with a close, almost impenetrable growth of flowery bushes, beginning on the sides of the fertile coast valleys and the dry interior plains. Their higher ridges, however, and mountains are open and fairly well forested with sugar pine, yellow pine, Douglas spruce, libocedrus, and white fir. As timber fountains, they amount to little, but as bird and bee pastures, cover for the precious streams that irrigate the lowlands, 
and quickly available retreats from dust and heat and care, their value is incalculable. Good roads have been graded into them, by which in a few hours lowlanders can get well up into the sky and find refuge in hospitable camps and clubhouses, where, while breathing reviving ozone, they may absorb the beauty about them and look comfortably down on the busy towns and the most beautiful orange groves ever planted since gardening began. The Grand Canyon Reserve of Arizona, of nearly two million acres, or the most interesting part of it, as well as the Rainier region, should be made into a national park on account of their supreme grandeur and beauty. Setting out from Flagstaff, a station on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, on the way to the canyon you pass through beautiful forests of yellow pine, like those of the Black Hills but more extensive, and curious dwarf forests of nut pine and juniper, the spaces between the miniature trees planted with many interesting species of eriogonum, yucca, and cactus. After riding or walking 75 miles through these pleasure grounds, the San Francisco and other mountains, abounding in flowery park-like openings and smooth, shallow valleys with long vistas, which in fineness of finish and arrangement suggest the work of a consummate landscape artist watching you all the way, you come to the most tremendous canyon in the world. It is abruptly countersunk in the forest plateau, so that you see nothing of it until you are suddenly stopped on its brink, with its immeasurable wealth of divinely colored and sculptured buildings before you and beneath you. No matter how far you have wandered hitherto, or how many famous gorges and valleys you have seen, this one, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, will seem as novel to you as unearthly in the color and grandeur and quantity of its architecture as if you had found it after death on some other star. So incomparably lovely and grand and supreme is it, above all the other canyons in our fire-molded, earthquake-shaken, rain-washed, wave-washed, river and glacier-sculptured world. It is about 6,000 feet deep where you first see it, and from rim to rim, 10 to 15 miles wide. Instead of being dependent for interest upon waterfalls, depth, wall sculpture, and beauty of park-like floor, like most other great canyons, it has not waterfalls in sight and no appreciable floor spaces. The big river has just enough room to flow and roar obscurely, here and there groping its way as best it can, like a weary, murmuring, overladen traveler, trying to escape from the tremendous, bewildering, labyrinthic abyss, while its roar serves only to deepen the silence. Instead of being filled with air, the vast space between the walls is crowded with nature's grandest buildings a sublime city of them, painted in every color, and adorned with richly fretted cornice and battlement spire and tower in endless variety of style and architecture. Every architectural invention of man has been anticipated, and far more, in this grandest of God's terrestrial cities. Chapter 2 The Yellowstone National Park Of the four national parks of the West, 
The Yellowstone is far the largest. It is a big, wholesome wilderness on the broad summit of the Rocky Mountains, favored with abundance of rain and snow, a place of fountains where the greatest of the American rivers take their rise. The central portion is a densely forested and comparatively level volcanic plateau, with an average elevation of about 8,000 feet above the sea. Surrounded by an imposing host of mountains, belonging to the subordinate Gallatin, Wind River, Teton, Absorca, and Snowy Ranges. Unnumbered lakes shine in it, united by a famous band of streams that rush up out of hot lava beds, or fall from the frosty peaks in channels rocky and bare, mossy and bosky, to the main rivers, singing cheerily on through every difficulty, cunningly dividing and finding their way east and west to the two far-off seas. Glacier meadows and beaver meadows are outspread with charming effect along the banks of the streams. Park-like expanses in the woods and innumerable small gardens in rocky recesses of the mountains, some of them containing more petals than leaves, while the whole wilderness is enlivened with happy animals. Beside the treasures common to most mountain regions that are wild and blessed with a kind climate, the park is full of exciting wonders. The wildest geysers in the world, in bright triumphant bands, are dancing and singing in it amid thousands of boiling springs, beautiful and awful, their basins arrayed in gorgeous colors like gigantic flowers, and hot paint pots, mud springs, mud volcanoes, mush and broth cauldrons, whose contents are of every color and consistency, plash and heave and roar in bewildering abundance. In the adjacent mountains, beneath the living trees, the edges of petrified forests are exposed to view, like specimens on the shelves of a museum, standing on ledges tier above tier where they grew, solemnly silent and rigid crystalline beauty after swaying in the winds thousands of centuries ago, opening marvelous views back into the years and climates and life of the past. Here too are hills of sparkling crystals, hills of sulfur, hills of glass, hills of cinders and ashes, Mountains of every style of architecture, icy and forested. Mountains covered with honey blooms sweet as hymettus. Mountains boiled soft like potatoes and colored like a sunset sky. A that and a that and twice as muckles a that. Nature has on show in the Yellowstone Park. Therefore, it is called Wonderland, and thousands of tourists and travelers stream into it every summer and wander about in it enchanted. Fortunately, almost as soon as it was discovered, it was dedicated and set apart for the benefit of the people, a piece of legislation that shines benignly amid the common dust and ashes history of the public domain, for which the world must thank Professor Hayden above all others, for he led the first scientific exploring party into it, described it, and with admirable enthusiasm urged Congress to preserve it. As delineated in the year 1872, the park contained about 3,344 square miles. 
on March 30, 1891, it was to all intents and purposes enlarged by the Yellowstone National Park Timber Reserve, and in December 1897 by the Teton Forest Reserve, thus nearly doubling its original area and extending the southern boundary far enough to take in the sublime Teton Range and the famous pasture lands of the big Rocky Mountain game animals. The withdrawal of this large tract from the public domain did no harm to anyone. For its height, 6,000 to over 13,000 feet above the sea, and its thick mantle of volcanic rocks, prevent its ever being available for agriculture or mining, while on the other hand, its geographical position, reviving climate, and wonderful scenery combine to make it a grand health, pleasure, and study resort, a gathering place for travelers from all the world. The national parks are not only withdrawn from sale and entry like the forest reservations, but are efficiently managed and guarded by small troops of United States Cavalry, directed by the Secretary of the Interior. Under this care, the forests are flourishing, protected from both axe and fire. And so, of course, are the shaggy beds of underbrush and the herbaceous vegetation. The so-called curiosities also are preserved, and the furred and feathered tribes many of which, in danger of extinction a short time ago, are now increasing in numbers. A refreshing thing to see amid the blind, ruthless destruction that is going on in the adjacent regions. In pleasing contrast to the noisy, ever-changing management or mismanagement of blundering, plundering, money-making vote sellers who receive their places from boss politicians as purchased goods. The soldiers do their duty so quietly that the traveler is scarce aware of their presence. This is the coolest and highest of the parks. Frosts occur every month of the year. Nevertheless, the tenderest tourist finds it warm enough in summer. The air is electric and full of ozone, healing, reviving, exhilarating, kept pure by frost and fire, while the scenery is wild enough to awaken the dead. It is a glorious place to grow in and rest in, camping on the shores of the lakes, in the warm openings of the woods golden with sunflowers on the banks of the streams, by the snowy waterfalls, beside the exciting wonders, or away from them, in the scallops of the mountain walls, sheltered from every wind, on smooth, silky lawns enameled with gentians, up in the fountain hollows of the ancient glaciers between the peaks, where cool pools and brooks and gardens of precious plants, charmingly embowered, are never wanting, and good rough rocks, with every variety of cliff and scar, are invitingly near for outlooks and exercise. From these lovely dens, you may make excursions whenever you like into the middle of the park, where the geysers and hot springs are reeking and spouting in their beautiful basins, displaying an exuberance of color and strange motion and energy, admirably calculated to surprise and frighten, charm and shake up the least sensitive, out of apathy into newness of life. And with that intoxicating vision, 
I think we'll end this evening's reading from Our National Parks by famed environmentalist John Muir. His descriptions of these regions are so vivid, I almost feel like I'm there. At the very least, I certainly want to go, and I hope you enjoyed that as well. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.